Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Manisha Arial, and I'm the Global Lead for Digital Development at Kamanix International and an organizing committee member of this annual Global Forum. It is my pleasure to welcome you to day two of the fourth annual Global Digital Development Forum. For those of you joining today, we started GDDF at around midnight on Tuesday, 12 a.m. on the 26th, to be precise, and ended our first day 16 hours later, around 4 p.m. yesterday. So we've had some fabulous keynotes and breakout sessions, some truly insightful lightning talks, and some very, very high quality hands-on workshops. And we still have a half day of sessions coming up. I'm joining you today from Washington, D.C., where we have a very crisp, clean, nice weather today. Where are you joining from? We'd love to hear from you on the chat. Bring it on. We're starting our keynote discussion today with three truly amazing individuals affiliated with three very different institutions in three very different countries. They are each dealing with some unique challenges democracy encounters in the digital space. We will look at how they navigate tech policy, how they interact with tech companies vis-a-vis -vis protection of individual rights, and how civil society organizations are working to combat digital repression and to keep the digital ecosystem open, safe, inclusive, and thriving. We're delighted to welcome to the main stage today, Boyan Perkov, Miraj Choudhury, and Richard Mulunga. I'm going alphabetically here. Boyan is a policy researcher at SHARE Foundation, where he tracks the state of digital rights and freedoms in Serbia. His expertise includes human rights, freedoms, and security at the intersection of society and technology. Miraj started Digitally Right in 2021 to support media, civil society, and businesses in Bangladesh and to adapt to changing information ecosystem. He oversees outreach for the Bangla-speaking region of the Global Investigative Journalism Network and teaches media research at the University of Professionals in Bangladesh. Richard is CEO of Bloggers of Zambia. He's the lead researcher on the Zambia Digital Rights Report, which is in its third edition. And Richard is part of a digital rights advocacy campaign, hashtag Open Space Zambia, and is focused on democratic internet law and policy in Zambia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Right, so I am going to ask you to take us to the day leading up to the national elections in your countries, Bangladesh, Serbia, and Zambia. And I'd like to begin with Bangladesh. Miraj, um, take us to election time in Bangladesh. What happens? And into the digital space. I imagine social media lights up, right? Elections with election related chatter. People probably discuss politics and politicians. What else happens in the media ecosystem in Bangladesh? Does the regulatory framework evolve at all? Thank you for having me, Manisha, first. Like, uh, yeah, we are we are uh, leading up to an election. And, you know, uh, this is pretty a big thing, but I think the main discussion around social media and media is like whether we are going to have a better election than before, rather discussing like the politics and politicians. So we can see the environment is getting more intense politically and also diplomatically. So there has been a lot of pressure on the government to hold a free and fair election. And, and there has been uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I think, exchanges of like, different uh, opinions between uh, political parties. Uh, I, I think this happens in every society in the world. But uh, what is uh, for the digital space, I think uh, what we can see is like uh, the spread of disinformation is becoming more challenging, uh, not only from actor level, but also we can see some of the mainstream media is also like uh, taking part in this dis disinformation spree. Uh, and also, I think uh, pressure on independent media is growing in a sense. From a recent uh, incident, we can see that the leading daily of Bangladesh, that is called Prothumalo, uh, its editor has been sued under the Digital Security Act. His reporters were arrested, and after five days, he was get bail uh, just uh, for a report on uh, hunger on the day of the independence. So. I think uh, overall the situation is intense and we can also see new uh, laws and regulations coming in to regulate the digital space. So uh, we have we had a small research on this, like every major digital. I think I'm sure you have a part of this that is because of the storming here. Uh, 
uh, but fine, we are fine. So uh, I think uh, every major digital loss in Bangladesh comes before elections. So, for example, in 2006, there was ICT Act. In 2013, there was amendment of this act. In 2018, there was this Digital Security Act. And this in 2023, we can see this Data Protection Act uh, draft is placed uh, before people and, and assume that it will be passed soon and it, and it it, it needs compulsory uh, to localize data uh, within Bangladesh jurisdiction, and it has a lot of human rights challenges within the draft. So legal space is also, digital legal space is also uh, uh, following the election trend, I would say. Uh, and, and, and there has been a lot of attempt uh, and a lot of uh, oversight uh, on the digital space on how uh, not only how informations are shared, but also how expressions are uh, regulated. Right. Elections in South Asia is always fascinating, right? Uh, Boyan, what about Serbia? I mean, you would had your last elections a year ago and the current president won by a large margin, right? How did the online freedom space evolve in the lead up to the April 2022 elections? Uh, it was really interesting to to follow all the you know discussions on social media and the entire let's say ecosystem of political communication that that uh, that is very you know engaged in Serbia even when there are no official political campaigns like all the time uh, we have uh, you know. Uh, these social media battles, these uh, Twitter rants, uh, Twitter, you know, attacks from different kind of actors, uh, both uh, who are from official political parties, but also some generally active, let's say, political people who are not uh, affiliated with any party, but are, you know, considered some kind, some kind of, um, you know, political commentators. So it's always uh, interesting to follow that and uh, these elections were also, I mean, that, that were held in 2022 were also interesting because they had like three major elections done at once. So we had parliamentary elections on one hand, we had presidential elections, as you mentioned, and we also had the elections for the Belgrade City Assembly. Belgrade is the capital of Serbia, a uh, city just under let's say 2 million people. And uh, it, it was also interesting to see that uh, the majority of political parties do not have some, let's say, clear strategy how to communicate things on social media, whereas the ruling party, which is the, the party which pres the president also uh, belongs to, uh, they have a very agile and active team uh, very strategically, let's say, planned out uh, communication, and this could all be seen when when you analyze their uh, social media posts, for example, Twitter and Facebook. That's uh, what we followed, and that's the the information uh, we could uh, we could gather. In terms of uh, Facebook, we could gather uh, the expenditure on the political marketing or in the political campaign because Meta now offers uh, that option for, for Serbia, that uh, like financial transparency element, which we didn't have before. And then the Share Foundation uh, initiated an advocacy effort to introduce this option to countries of the Western Balkans, uh, not only Serbia, but, but other countries. And uh, they, they, you know, recognize probably that Serbia is an important market for for their products and that, that's why we now have uh, these uh, this information on how much money was spent on each post and compared to all other uh, political parties and the politician pages because you have for example a political party page but you also have a page from a prominent politician, let's say a uh, president of the party, they also uh, invested uh, significant amounts of money. And as I recall, the ruling party invested like the, the most uh, funds compared to, to other parties who are 
let's say, opposition parties. So there, there you also have uh, the, the clear indication that significant resources are being um, are being uh, invested in in the online political campaign, not just monetary, but also uh, let's say human resources too, because uh, they they had uh, a number of very active uh, politicians and candidates uh, from their party who were engaged on Twitter and attacking the leaders of the opposition and the uh, other people who, you know, contradict their political views. Right. Wow. Huh. That's 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 interesting. Um, Richard, in his uh, inauguration speech in August, uh, President Hakiende Echlema declared a new dawn for Zambia, right? And he um, described for us what the digital space looked like in Zambia previous to 2021. And if you're starting to see a sunrise in terms of digital freedoms. Thank you very much. So um, we had our elections on uh, August 12, 2021. And the, the period, two or three years before those elections up to, there was a lot of repression. There were all these gimmicks. We saw the enactment of very problematic uh, cyber legislation like the, the Cyber Security and Cyber Security Act. We had the enactment of the Data Protection Act and so on and so forth. And uh, these laws were actually used to facilitate for the blockage of social media, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Signal, and others. Between um, August 12 and August 14, 2021. And you see, we had our elections when uh, we had these standing orders, um, the COVID-19 restrictions. So there were no political activities like going to attend rallies or politicians having rallies. So everyone was uh, using the internet, you know, to access information and for politicians to reach out to their voters. So it was like everyone was now going to the internet, you know, to Facebook, to WhatsApp, to just access information and to interact and just have all those conversations around elections. And there were all these strategies, you know. There, there was uh, this militarization of the of the internet. There were all these strategies uh, targeted at online content regulation. Uh, senior government officials, including the president and his ministers and his wife, you know, accusing Zambians that they are using social media to insult leaders and that the police, including the ICT regulator policing the internet, monitoring what citizens are doing on the internet, and that uh, these people that are insulting leaders will be arrested. And there was, if you look at the, what the calling insults, is just the citizens asking the question why. Like, uh, it's citizens just participating in the democracy, by enjoying their freedom of association, assembly, and especially expression. So, uh, like, many people now were so afraid to express themselves, were so afraid that the police are going to arrest them, that the ICT regulator is There's actually surveillance going on. Uh, and, and some people are actually being arrested merely for expressing themselves, merely for challenging the ruling party, the president, the ministers, and the, the me members of parliament and all that. So that was what was going on before the election that was very problematic. Uh, and, 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 you know, we went to the election, so the president Haka and the came through, and he came, you know, on the slate that he was going to uh, review, even repeal, or just get rid of this problematic cyber legislation, including the Public Order Act and, and other pieces of subsidiary legislation and, and the Supreme Law, the Constitution. Um, yeah, the country is a bit stable now. People are able to express themselves. The President Hitchleb has even gone ahead to actually uh, remove Section 69 of the Penal Code, which is uh, criminal defamation of the President. Um, the process of revising the problematic cyber security and cyber crime act started in September last year, and we made submission with other uh, uh, um, civil society, the law society, uh, lawyers, the academia, and so on and so forth. But we have a problem with that because there's no timeline like when we are going to have this law revised or reviewed so that we can have appropriate legislation that is going to you know, make the internet accessible so that, you know, there's meaningful access to the internet, that the internet is resilient, it is safe and secure for everyone else, especially women and girls 
who are actually you know suffering from uh, online gender-based violence, bullying, and all this and that. So that is where now we, we have the problem with present HLM as a new dawn kind of vibe. Like, can you give us a timeline? And you know, it is now over 200 days since you were elected, and you told us immediately that you are showing power. You are going to work on this, but you know, you haven't. You are not doing this. So like, we are trying to. Finding him every day that uh, the internet is, is 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 at the center of our democracy. Like um, the we the internet is 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 very influential into the realization of Zambia's democracy because of the right to expression that everyone else is is uh, is using, you know, to strengthen democracy. So if we cannot express ourselves, then our democracy is dead. We cannot participate. We don't feel inclusive. You know, we don't feel like uh, we are part of the governance systems and. Uh, the, the, because the, this problematic cyber legislation is enforceable by the police, and even now, some people are being questioned, some people are being arrested, some people actually are appearing before the courts, are being prosecuted because of what they have said or the, what they have done on the internet. And this is happening under the new Don government. So, for President Ichilema's the declaration of the new Don uh, uh, kind of setup to be a realistic, we have to see that he has to get rid of this problematic cyber legislation and bring in place uh, legislation that is actually going to make the, the, the internet to be an enabler of, of our democracy. So that is our story. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Miraj and uh, Boyan, both for sort of like setting the stage for us a little bit, right? So my first, uh, well, my question now goes to uh, Miraj. Um, you know, just as you were talking, I was just thinking, Bangladesh is such a remarkable story of poverty reduction and economic growth. Um, just in the last half century, it's gone from like being one of the poorest uh, nations to achieving like lower min middle income status. Uh, and now is sort of soon to graduate from the UN's LDC list, right? We had uh, Kamal Kadir, uh, the CEO of Bikash, uh, in our opening keynote yesterday, and we heard the story of like phenomenal growth of digital payments in Bangladesh. So my question now is to you is like, how do you balance um, between citizens' rights um, and you know uh, economic growth? How does that play out in Bangladesh? What are you seeing? Well, I think Bangladesh's robust economic growth, uh, there are two factors uh, that have been driving this. One is uh, the growing private sector uh, export of RMGs and, and the remittances. It is a country of 170 million people. So I think people largely drive this economy. But in the last past 10 years, I think uh, the digital technology has contributed a lot to this growth. Uh, for example, you mentioned about Bikash, which uh, companies like Bikash revolutionized or transformed financial inclusion in Bangladesh. Uh, it, it, it has a robust impact now. People can access financial services at the grassroots with, with just a mobile phone. Telecom companies, access to internet revolutionized how people get access to different services, not only that, but also like uh, expressing their opinions and expressing uh, uh, it also facilitated expression uh, to a great deal. This expansion of Internet access and other services also enabled to grow a new uh, digital services, new wave of digital services in the form of e-commerce, e-commerce, small entrepreneurs are selling products on uh, Facebook. And Bangladesh is one of the largest uh, uh, contributor in the Greek economy in terms of human resources. Uh, Literally hundreds and thousands of people are like freelancing, uh, building softwares, graphics designing, and doing different Greeks. Uh, and and it is in 2019, it's estimated is a is a market about like a 500 million dollars, which is I think right now is a lot more than that. So I think technology is meant to improve people's lives. It did. Technology is meant to create new businesses. It did. There are new startups are coming. They are raising points. There are companies like Pikash. Uh, which aspires to be a billion dollar company then so, so if it is already not so. So uh, there are large telecom companies providing services. So they are making money. Are they making money? Probably they are making money as well. So there is business, there is services, there is access, uh, but is there 
uh, enabling space that respects digital rights of the people, I think we are lagging in that particular space. So, for example, uh, like these big companies, tech companies, local tech companies, we have never seen them engage with civil society or others, or even just to talk about uh, like a just digital space, uh, a just legal system. So that there is a digital security act, which is a bad, bad act. This data protection act, it has uh, controversial aspects into the draft, but. Uh, the local tech companies don't talk about this. They do not engage. The, more, the way they engage with the authorities, they do not engage with the civil society in this rights-related discussion. So, for example, like uh, there is lack of transparency, I would say, as well from the company side. So, uh, so there are internet shutdowns in Bangladesh in several times, but I don't see any large telecom companies disclosing in their sustainability or transparency reports that uh, how many times they have. Uh, like they have taken steps uh, or they have implemented shutdowns, which is kind of a rights violation. So how, what amount of data, telephone call records have been shared with the authorities? Yeah, for how data are being used. So I think this transparency are call of time. If if these big businesses, which are the, bene which are the beneficial of this technological transformation, if you are not contributing to a just legal system, just digital society, uh, you will be the victim of it. And one day, good companies will be victim. There is a cost of an unjust society. This cost, either you incur it as a loss or you pass it over to the people. Yeah. So I think uh, there is more to be done in the right space, uh, not from the government, but also from the private sector. And there is a greater need of engagement between not only the government and civil society, but also uh, there is a need for engagement from the private sector uh, to engage in this rights discussion. Right. Wow. Um, Richard, the previous government in Zambia had introduced the Cybersecurity and Cyber Crimes Act, uh, which bars, I believe, the production and distribution of uh, content tending to corrupt uh, morals and criminalize the, criminalize the use of electronic communications in to coerce, intimidate, harass, or cause emotional distress to a person without really defining those terms. And I remember there was a pretty robust discussion about this in Zambia and internationally as well. Where is the act or where's the discussion at the moment? So that is uh, section 54 of the Cyber Security and Cyber Crimes Act of 2021. Um, and I think other sections, uh, part, part four, that are very problematic. They are purposely vague. The definitions are loose. And um, the, the, so the, the thing is that because of those problems that we have identified, uh, we are working with our lawyers, we are working with uh, academia, we are working with um, a, a group of lawyers like the Law Society, Chapter One Foundation and others, other CSOs. Um, uh, we have gone to court, we have petitioned this, this, this law because uh, some parts are problematic, they are contrary to the constitution, they are parallel to the constitution and other legislation. Uh, those parts that are petitions, uh, they limit uh, our rights, our digital rights, and just everything else. The the, the law broadly is a, is a, is a threat to Zambia's the, the growing democracy. Uh, so that is where we are. It is in court, and um, the court process is going on. We are petitions part of the the the, the law. The, uh, it is enforceable. It is applicable, and. Um, because of the, the, the President Hichilema's pronouncements, uh, election promises, he promised to revise the law. So they have initiated uh, the revision of the law. So they, in September 2022, they called for stakeholder submissions, like uh, which parts of the law are problematic and proposing to replace. So we have made those submissions. They are with the, the Ministry of Communications, uh, the Technology and Science right now. Um, uh, the, but the process is taking too long from September this year. We have not gotten anything, and there's no timeline as to when this law tabled in Parliament for debate, when it will be opened up for further review by, by the public, and when the law will be enacted. So that is where we are. We are still doing the back and forth, and uh, there's no political will, uh, like in terms of practical mechanisms, apart from political pronouncements, and that is actually very problematic because we are almost three years down the line and our presidential 
system is that the the, the, the elections are five years, uh, uh, and we are we may find uh, at another election, and then we go back to the political rhetoric. So that is what we are working on right now, like a, to push for this law to be revised because it is actually now being used to limit expression. It is actually being used to limit what Zambians can do on the internet. The law provides for throttling of the internet. It provides actually for total shutdown of the internet. It provides for just limiting and it is contributing to this, um, what is it called, the shrinking civic space. Uh, uh, for us, the internet uh, uh, provides for alternative spaces for citizens. For us, the internet is at the center of democracy. There's between technology and democracy. So you find that Zambia has joined this growing digital authoritarianism, not only in sub saharan Africa, but I think even in Bangladesh, where we are hearing from Obama. So this is why we are pushing against the locomotive, just to ensure that our freedoms are not uh, uh, limited, that our freedoms are not tempered with, and that we want to contribute to you know, growing democracy, not only in Zambia, but globally as well. Awesome. Thank you. I mean, Boyan, I was just like, as you're listening to um, uh, Richard and Miraj talk, I wonder if there's like, you know, insights from Serbia that we could bring on. Like, you know, how has the civil society um, uh, sort of like, you know, uh, economic growth being balanced out there? Like, you know, how is civil society engaging with like, you know, tech companies, for example? Um. The companies in that sense in Serbia, I would say, if we're talking about the global tech platforms, I wouldn't say they are kind of like the main uh, economy generator because Serbia uh, in itself is a very well-developed IT industry with a lot of, you know, gaming and development uh, companies, but also a lot of outsourcing IT work uh, is being done in Serbia. And uh, I would say this is uh, one of the key factors to, to Serbia's economic growth because these people, uh, they, they are very well paid. They have high salaries compared uh, to people working in many other industries. And uh, from that uh, sense, civil society is more uh, included in some, let's say, uh, problematic applications of uh, high-end technology and uh, the latest, um, you know, like the well, latest uh, technological uh, and advanced, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence-based technology. Uh, for example, the, the cameras that can be used for biometric mass surveillance, which uh, is part of the Safe City project in Belgrade. And uh, there, the civil society has uh, strongly, let's say, um, it, it was a united front of Share Foundation and other uh, partner organizations who engaged in uh, this uh, advocacy, let's say, and with uh, some kind of you know discussion and debate with the government during uh, the past several years over the use of uh, such a system, which according to Serbian law doesn't have any uh, legal grounds to be used. So these are, uh, you know, smart cameras, analytics devices that can be uh, used uh, to surveil practically every corner of one city and uh, consequently lead to uh, the public spaces being uh, a place where you wouldn't have any privacy because of these advanced features such as uh, facial recognition, behavior analysis, uh, uh, tracking detection, movement detection, crowd detection, all, all these things uh, that are marketed for subsystems. And uh, also the vendor for this system is the Chinese tech giant Huawei. So it also kind of has a political um, a political dimension because these deals are basically concluded between the governments of Serbia and China 
and then Huawei is, uh, let's say, a technical implementing partner uh, in, in this project. And I think that the, these are the things that uh, are the most uh, challenging and uh, that they can present uh, a really problematic you know, situation once they are installed, because how do you remove such a system? You know, the, there are also economic interests here at stake, also the political situation is uh, something to take into account, but it is also important to note that uh, it doesn't matter basically uh, that it's um, Chinese equipment, the Chinese partner, uh, such system is very dangerous. It doesn't matter for, for privacy and uh, freedom of expression and freedom of movement and gathering, regardless of who is the actual vendor, because there are many companies in other countries in the US and uh, Japan and all across the world in Europe, in Europe as well, who also produce and the market and sell these very invasive biometric surveillance technologies. Right. So um, I have a follow up question, but, you know, before that, let me just sort of like invite our um, audience to sort of post their questions in the chat. You know, we'll we'll take we'll be taking questions. So we'd love to hear from you. Any of our uh, to any of our panelists here, please feel free to sort of like drop a line or drop a question, comments, whatever you have. Um, so when I was rereading the report that Share Foundation and Bjorn uh, published, I think it was digital rights falter amidst political and social unrest, which uh, mapped the digital, you know, the, the challenges in the digital space in the region. And then I remember it was undermining democratic elections. Uh, There's like hacking of public uh, service websites, provoking and exploiting social unrest, uh, flooding of conspiracy theories and fake news, targeting online hatred towards the most vulnerable, irresponsible use of tech. Um, and, and I think this was carried out before COVID, um, sort of wanted you to take us uh, to what it is like now, what it was, was, what was it like before COVID and have things started to change, um, you know, since then in Serbia? Uh, yeah. So the situation is, uh, I would say, pretty much similar. It's just that the whole situation with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was used maybe to introduce some uh, additional, uh, let's say, information systems, which were not thought through to the end, let's say. Because when you build such systems, you need privacy by design, privacy by default, security by design, security by default. Okay, we can say, uh, it was uh, a situation that uh, needed, uh, if it was a very, let's say, um, complicated social situation, you need big, uh, you need big solutions fast, you need to react. Uh, but regardless, uh, it, it just followed up on the trend from uh, previous years that we had. For example, that you have uh, an app to schedule an appointment with your general practitioner practitioner doctor uh, which didn't have any kind of you know privacy policy or anything that or you didn't know what they take for x how it does how it does it etc and uh, we had the Serbia this information system called the covid-19 information system where basically all the data was aggregated about the pandemic how many people are tested how many people were found to be positive and uh, other other related data uh, regarding that. And then we had the situation that uh, public health institution published the credentials to log into the system on their main website. So it was a, a public uh, page. And uh, this was discovered, of course, by uh, by uh, Shed, by Shed Foundation, and we notified the relevant authorities immediately. They, of course, uh, removed this information from the webpage. But the issue is that it was there 
for long enough to be put, picked up uh, by uh, Google uh, indexing. So basically, anyone could make, you know, a screenshot of the page, or you know, somehow get this uh, get this page from the internet cache and still access this information, which is, you know, uh, very difficult. But uh, then, on the other hand, you have to understand that uh, many people working in such medical institutions don't have, you know, that there are no proper uh, trainings, education, there are also no capacities maybe to hire more people with expertise uh, regarding information security, data protection, that can think through, you know, things like this. So we all we always kind of on a back foot and kind of have this reactive approach when something happens, whether it should be, you know, the, the other way around. Right. So <laughs> we're midway in our conversation and let's take a break and catch up on the questions from our participants on the chat. Um, you know, we have a question, which I think is for all three of you. Um, and uh, the question is, Keeping in mind that individual rights and national security can often clash in context of counterterrorism and cybersecurity, how can CSOs and INGOs fit in and what opportunities can be explored for navigating this complexity, given that governments can and should be a partner for change while also pushing for protection of rights and digital freedoms? Maybe we can start with you, Miraj. Uh, I think this has been uh, this has been a very old question, uh, and, and uh, terrorism, cybersecurity. I think these are digital threats that are coming in that needs to be addressed. And there is, a, I think, there is at least in our case, there is. Uh, it is not that there is no consensus around that. That yeah, people should be protected online. Uh, national security should be protected online. Yeah, but. Uh, problem arises when like this uh, definitions of exceptions are too broad, which we see in these new emerging laws, uh, and and these over broad uh, over broad uh, definitions, uh, this uh, arbitrary power to the authorities. I think when the legal system is something like that, it creates a lot of tension, and and it it creates a lot of scope for abuse. Yeah. So I think in this discussion, at least in our case, we do not have a very strong digital rights community, but civil society has been vocal around, like, around, like there has been a lot of pressure on the government, uh, and government is also talking to civil society organization, INGOs, on how they can amend or, or what they should do with the Digital Security Act. We can see there are submissions to BTR's uh, ministries on this Data Protection Act. I, I at least personally know uh, uh, half a dozen of uh, organizations who's, who made submissions uh, on the rights aspect of this particular uh, date, draft data protection. Uh, uh, but how do civil society and INGOs uh, collaborate uh, in such uh, to create a better legal space in the digital front? Uh, to some extent, uh, it depends on the government and depends on the political culture and depends on the uh, democratic state of democracy to particular that country, whether government would listen to that or not. Yeah, so it, it varies. Probably in European Union, it is more liberal. Uh, to just listen to that. But probably in Bangladesh and India uh, or maybe in other countries, in Zambia, uh, there is a trend of like... Uh, like having more restrictive laws and policies of the space. Uh, but in terms of cybersecurity and terrorism, I think there is, uh, the gap is not that wide, but I think uh, in this part of the world, the discussion is on uh, the abuse of such laws uh, and, and an action of such laws that can be uh, contrary to the right. The problematic part is, even when government and civil society talks, we do not see much engagement that I talked before uh, from the tech community, business community, uh, collaborating or engaging with INGOs and civil society. Yeah. So uh, I think this is an area where there is much room for improvement. Yeah. I, I am talking about local tech companies. So And, and this big multinational face, Meta or, 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 or say Google, they have their own channels. They do their talks in their own ways. Yeah. Uh, 
but I think the ecosystem is made of users, ecosystem is made of civil society organizations, government, uh, and, and big private sector companies. Uh, and, and I think uh, everyone should play their role. And I think uh, multi-stakeholder forums uh, where there is a level of transparency uh, and where is there, where there is a level of understanding and mutual respect uh, can be platforms where you can have these discussions in a better way and, and go towards resolving the problems. Right. What about, uh, what about Zambia, Richard? I mean, what has worked there in terms of countering democratic black backsliding? How have civil society organizations, um, you know, tech companies or INGOs, local tech companies or INGOs have, you know, worked together to keep the space safe and vibrant? I'm just summarizing the <laughs> question so, from so, the chat for you. Yes. So, so we, uh, for example, we have... Uh, been uh, working with our lawyers to strengthen uh, strategic litigation, especially now when uh, uh, democracy in Zambia seems to be stabilizing with a new government where there is uh, this vibe going on that is pro-human rights. So the courts are more trustworthy, uh, more independent, and, and, and all that. So strategic litigation is one of the, the issues that, that is going on. And uh, also civil society working together like uh, not working in silos, working individually, but uh, coming together, doing research together, doing evidence-based uh, kind of advocacy, and also uh, strategizing around uh, advocacy um, processes, maybe uh, confrontational kind of uh, processes, uh, creating that gap between civil side and the government and just peddling all the the, what uh, that kind of uh, situation where you cannot sit in one room and dialogue, but also we are focusing more on a kind of advocacy that is more engaging rather than uh, confrontational. That is also working. Uh, also, we are taking a lot of processes to inform and educate a civil society because look at uh, like the digital rights, internet governance kind of work that we are doing is more technical. It is new and. There's a lot of there's a lot of gaps in terms of digital literacy, even among um, activists and and uh, human rights defenders. So we are taking deliberate steps to giving them uh, technical know-how, technical skills, like to understand internet law and policy trends, not only in sub-Saharan Africa here, but also global trends. For um, uh, informing and educating, capacitating others, for example, on uh, the AU mechanism. The, the Malabo Convention, the AU mechanism on uh, personal data protection and cyber security, and even the what the, the Budapest Convention, looking at the UN mechanisms, looking at uh, just all the regional instruments, and uh, so that you know everybody could be able to demand the, their rights in the digital age to ensure that you know even we influence um, internet law and policy formulation processes to ensure that uh, you know there are no excesses in the implementation of of these. Uh, uh, problematic cyber legislation. So that is how, that is the story from Zan. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, you know, uh, what about uh, you, Boyan? Like, you know, uh, it, you know, unlike uh, Bangladesh and Zambia, um, Serbia is like very, uh, it's in, it, you know, it's like, it's a small country in the midst of a, thriving region, right? So what strategies have worked for Serbia? You know, uh, do you work more in collaboration with other countries? How how do you navigate this space? Um, in terms of, uh, you mean cybersecurity challenges or? Mm -hmm. Right, and, okay. and, you know, strategies that have worked in terms of sort of like, you know, advocacy. Uh, I think that uh, what is important uh, in such space is to gather as uh, much a wide coalition as possible. So not only civil society, but to try to engage all the relevant stakeholders. Uh, for example, people who are coming also from the private sector and who are independent consultants, and to try to have, you know, sort of this inclusive debate on matters that, that could be uh, important, not only when some uh, specific opportunity arises, for example, when a law is being changed or amended, but uh, in general, you know, 
to have some some sort of uh, gathering. Uh, the, that's why uh, in Serbia, for example, we have these uh, special certs, so computer emergency response teams for very, let's say, specific sector uh, type of things. Share Foundation, uh, for example, has uh, such a cert that is working with the online media and the civil society, but there is also, for example, a cert for financial institutions and banks. And therefore, we need to uh, engage also the, the relevant state institutions who work in this area, which would work in this area, uh, in order to be able, you know, to, to see the whole picture and exchange experiences. Because uh, if you advocate for something, you need also you need to, you know, take into account the challenges and issues of some of the other sides who have other angles and you know, try to find some sort of uh, middle ground. So, <laughs> I guess, um, Miraj, like, unlike European countries, uh, right, uh, or even Africa, I get the sense that South Asian countries are on their own on this one. Uh, how does regional politics play out? Like, for example, how does uh, Indian interests or how does Chinese sort of like, you know, interests play out? Uh, in Bangladesh, like, do you work with regional coalitions? How does it work similarly? How does that work for you? I think at least in the digital rights space, uh, we are yet to have a very strong community here. Uh, there is not many civil society, or many or uh, I think uh, there is not enough uh, civil society organizations who deals with digital rights among, or focuses on that. Uh, we are trying to build this community on on regional coalitions or uh, networks. I think uh, we have been more in touch with international coalitions and uh, networks uh, and organizations. To be frank, like say for example, Access Now uh, and and others and GNI. Uh, so uh, this works. Uh, I think uh, we have been in touch with them. So when you know the the political space is very narrow. Yeah, the civic space is like shrinking like anything. So the only space you have to express, uh, only even on the space you have some, uh, the space you have even to protest is sometimes the digital space, this online space. So I think like it is a, it has become a bigger discussion like how you how you secure this space so that you have this you can you can have these democratic voices out there. Uh, and in this discussion, as I told you, like. The business is adapting digital technologies very fast. Yeah, there are digital transformation in private sector, but it's fast. Government is uh, knows these threats of digital uh, risks as well, and and these new laws and initiatives are coming in. So this is increasing. They are like from digital Bangladesh, we are going to smart Bangladesh. There is a policy like that. So, but I think civil society is yet to catch up. There is lack of capacity until and unless there is enough capacity. So the solution is long term. We are trying to see that how we can build new people, new new young generation, a generation of advocates who can talk about it, who have nuanced idea, who are informed, who can argue based on information. Uh, we we are create trying to create information. Yeah? So there are organizations who are trying to create information so that people are uh, people are more enlightened and talk about this. And until and unless there is a strong community, I think one way which work better is like these collaborations with different organizations, international NGOs, international organizations who can help you to uh, make your voice heard in the global community. And, and, and also uh, you find solidarity in voices so that voices of theirs also fill in the void that you have in this space, yeah. So I think this is uh, this is so far has been significant, but the solution is longer term. We need to invest in people. We need a new generation of young activists, advocates, uh, lawyers, journalists, civil society leaders who can who can deal with these emerging digital problems and and unjust legal systems in terms of regulating digital space. How do you uh, how do you create that? You know, how do you create that new generation of uh, civil society that wow. is able to sort of like, you know, look at tech trends, 
talk to tech companies, really understand what is going on under the hood of that particular tech or, you know, how, how does that work? I think one way is like creating opportunities for people. It, it, you, you know, living a standard good life is one of the major challenges in this country. So when you have to offer new knowledge, it should also be aligned with new opportunities. So uh, so there is more interest in this. So, for example, we have a like, tech policy fellowship where we bring uh, people from academia or media and, and also, uh, say, for technology so that they can work for like six months to go through a rigorous economy, academic uh, process and produce uh, white papers or research on this. So I think uh, other organizations are like doing this different legal submissions, they're writing in papers. Uh, so media, at least some of the media are taking serious, uh, uh, taking these issues seriously and writing this. And this creates an environment of where people take interest into these issues and you create new people who can write, who can talk. And in this way, you build a uh, a network. So I think it is important that uh, I think uh, one invest in this new people. Uh, it is long term process. You don't create it in one or two years. Probably in five years, you get three person uh, who is recognized, who is valued in the society to talk about digital rights. Yeah. So uh, in this so process, I think uh, it is partnerships. It is uh, collaborations that can make it happen. Yeah. So. And again, academic uh, organizations like universities, institutes. Into, uh, can we send three people to study public policy in the US or UK so that they come back with new ideas and, and discuss these issues in a more nuanced way? Uh, so, uh, can we, so there are many avenues, but what I am trying to say is like create people, invest in people, invest in knowledge so that you have a community around this who will talk about this, who will engage, who have the same parity, so they can talk with the technology people from the same level. Yeah. So this inequality should be adjusted to some extent, then you can have a better community, better solutions. Great. Thank you. I think I'll turn it over to uh, also to uh, Boyan and ask the same questions. How do you or how does Share Foundation or how do uh, organizations in Europe, like how do you create that next generation of civil society activists that is able to sort of like navigate this uh, this space, the digital democracy space? Uh, I think uh, that you need to have some, you know, um, specific, uh, let's say, uh, value material to work with. So if you find people who are, you know, advocating for very important values, such as, such as uh, the respect of human rights, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of expression, for example, the right to uh, privacy and then all other related rights. And if you have people who are, you know, advocating and uh, uh, they themselves believe in the idea of open, decentralized, uh, internet as a means of, you know, accessing and also spreading knowledge, then you are on a good path. And uh, all these other things, you know, you you learn and you pick up from experience. So it it is not anything like there. There is no, uh, let's say, uh, the digital uh, rights university or something. <laughs> Although, for example, yeah. Uh, although, for example, the Share Foundation organizes a lot of educational activities, a lot, lots of uh, trainings. We work with uh, all kinds of different civil society and the media organizations in order to be able to engage them in the digital issues. So there isn't a sort of like a monopoly on just one or maybe several organizations in this space, but that uh, the organizations who work on other issues for example, LGBTI uh, organizations, uh, organizations of uh, minority communities that are also engaged and empowered to, you know, work in the, the digital rights space uh, on human rights and technology issues, because in the end it concerns us all. And uh, I think that it is also uh, a very important strategic point 
not uh, just to be like a hub for everything, but to try to empower others because uh, you you gain very, very, I would say, powerful allies uh, in, in the long run in that way. Right. Thank you. I guess the same question for you, Richard, like what are you seeing in the region, uh, in Zambia, in terms of like creating this momentum, creating this sort of like, you know, space for civil society to sort of come together and uh, work on the digital rights space um, and sort of keeping this uh, uh, space sort of free and open for everyone. What strategies are working for you? So, so, so what, what is working is that um, we have seen that um, the problems that we face in the region are similar, uh, but in different environments. I'll give an example of uh, Zambia here, the, 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 the democratic space is a little bit uh, open, opening up, it's open up. But if you look at a country like Zimbabwe, the repression is real, militarization of everything else. If you go to Uganda, I think we see in the media like a, uh, it's so bad. The constitution is even tied to the president's age because he can change it every time he wants to contest an election and we have got all these problematic cyber legislation. You go to Kenya, the Computer Misuse and Cyber Security Act also is, is in court, I think, since, 20, since 2017, just like in Zambia here. If you go to Tanzania, you find that the problems are similar. Uh, you go to, to, to Eswatini, Botswana, Lesotho, the, the problems are the same. And all these countries that I've mentioned are just among the 54 countries who are members of the African Union. Yeah. And uh, we actually, there's actually saying that our presidents, uh, there's a suspicion that they have a WhatsApp group where they, they share these ideas about how to be repressive and which law to enact so that, you know, they can just take care of this uh, freedom that are enjoying on the internet. So, we are because of the similarity of problems. Uh, we are seeing networks. We are seeing coalitions across the region, across the regions like in the south, in the east, and in Central Africa, all the way up to the north. And uh, there is also a block. Like we meet also as civil society, as stakeholders, uh, non-government actors. We are meeting also um, uh, across the continent, like to also strategize, coming up with uh, joint advocacy strategies, campaigns, but also adapting them to the particular countries so that we can push back against this uh, digital uh, authoritarianism that, that is becoming widespread. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, we're almost to the end of our, uh, you know, allotted hour. But, you know, before I sort of like uh, wrap up, I wanted to uh, turn it over to you all and see if you had any last thoughts, um, whether, you know, just about this conversation, or just in terms of like, you know, each other's space, you know, if there was any advice you wanted to give each other or suggestions or ask questions, I wanted to sort of like open that up for you. So for, for me, what I would like to say, like in the last, uh, there was that, uh, I think, input that came from the, from our, uh, the audience about that balance between human rights and uh, security like in zambia i think in africa yeah, that is one of the biggest problems that we have actually in most of these countries that i mentioned that is what actually has is that is one of the reasons actually why we have problematic cyber legislation but even other any other legislation public order legislation are very problematic because there is over prioritization of security and the, even in defining it purposely vague or to just suit those that are enjoying political power uh, and, and and I think we know what human rights are. We know what uh, security is. So there's need to balance what between security. We need that delicate balance between security and human rights. What should we prioritize? Uh, and you know we cannot have security without human rights. We cannot have rights also without security. So we have to have this debate, and I think it's a big debate globally, especially in sub-Saharan here, sub-Saharan Africa here, where I mean we have this history of dictatorship of uh, arbitrary leaders and all this and that. So I think in the interest of time, I'll just leave it like that because it's a debate for another day. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Miraj. I think uh, there is noise of a sound around me, but I would like to summarize in a single sentence in a way that, you know, uh, anything that 
uh, gets momentum when you have a popular understanding, popular support to that cause, you know, so if it is not too noisy, sorry. So I think there is a great popular understanding about human rights, but there is not enough popular understanding about digital rights. If people do not support you, how do you make it popular? I think we need to invest in this because the digital world, the digital universe is new. We do not know how to adapt with it. We do not know really how to regulate it. There are lots of confusions. So the discussion of rights gets lost here, let alone taking it to the people. I think how we can do that. I think that is the next biggest question. And that is one way to save digital democracy. Awesome. Thank you, Miraj. Uh, Boyan? Um, yeah, thoughts? I think the yeah, I think uh, the varying experiences from different parts of the world can benefit us all, but we also need to be aware of the potential challenges. I think so. One thing that is maybe not a problem in your country today, but is a problem somewhere else, can pop up very easily. So you always need to be mindful of that and use uh, other experiences uh, from the world that we can now find about with, you know, networking and uh, all, all different uh, types of communication that we now have at our disposal. Thank you. So looks like, you know, coalition building and networking is the answer <laughs> to us since there's no digital right to university, as you mentioned, right? Um, great. Thank you, friends. Thank you, each of you, for this wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. And thank you also to our participants for your questions and comments on the chat. We still have four more hours to go. Great keynotes, lightning talks, breakout sessions, workshops. Stay with us.